Hello, and welcome everyone to Open Office Hours presented by Headway. Um, every month, we break down different startup concepts to help you gain traction in the most important parts of your business. And today, we're going to talk about customer research methods for your startup. Why do we want to talk about that? Because time and time again, we see founders talking to customers and they're asking the wrong questions. You know what that means? That means bad data. That's not good. And at Headway, we believe that bad data is worse than no data at all. But don't worry, we're here. We're going to tell you what to talk about when you talk to customers so you don't get that bad data and you don't build the wrong thing. So with that, my name is Jacob Miller. I'm the marketing brand manager here at Headway. I help host most of our YouTube live streams here. I'm super excited to talk with Ryan Hatch today about this topic. So Ryan, introduce yourself. Hey, everyone. Um, welcome to Open Office Hours. Ryan Hatch, head of product here at Headway. And Jacob, excited to be diving in and hope we get some great conversations going today with, uh, with startup founders on customer research. Awesome. Very cool. So how this is going to work is we're going to watch a short video together that's from our Startup Foundation series. You can find it on our website at headway.io and go to resources. Um, but we're going to we're going to actually play one of those videos now to kind of just quickly go through kind of the key the key approach and points of of effective customer research methods. And then we'll hop back in here together. We'll go through a couple more things and we'll and we'll and if you have questions along the way, feel free to put them in the chat and, and we'll and we'll do that. So. I'm going to hit play in the video and then we'll regroup uh, just after that. When launching a new company, we kind of think of it like, hey, the business is at the center. The product is at the center. It's all about the business and the product. And the customers are kind of like on the outside of that. And I would challenge that viewpoint. I would actually invert that picture. I think it's actually the customer on the inside is the center and the market and the product and the business actually have to pivot around what the customer's needs actually are. So there's a word for that. We, we actually have some nomenclature for that. We would call it problem space and solution space. So before we dive right into the, pro, right into the solution and right into building, our suggestion is let's pause for a moment and let's actually unpack the customer, their, their life, what they're actually going through, and, and dive into that problem. There's a pattern for this. It's called design thinking. And you'll see here, here in the visual that we actually have two diamonds. Just as I was saying, we have the solution space on the right and we have the problem space on the left. And you'll come in and you'll say, well, I already know my customers. I, I know the problem. And while that might be true, often what happens is we understand the problem in a general way. We have a general problem statement, but we need to get to, to actually solution correctly or solution very, very well is get to a specific problem. So how do we approach research? How do we go from a generic problem statement to a specific problem statement. There are two categories of research. One is primary research. This is super valuable. This is where we're talking to actual customers, unpacking how they feel, where they're struggling, and, and their daily lives are really getting deep with customers. The other type of research is secondary research. This is also valuable in different ways. This is traditional market research, looking at market reports, stats, Excel sheets, top-down, Forrester reports, Gartner reports, and trying to size the market in a way or, or get some trend lines on where things might be headed. But, but secondary research really isn't helpful to get down to actual specific problems. What we need to do is talk to real customers and unpack their real, real life stories. And so we're gonna suggest using primary research. Talking to customers is so valuable, it cannot be understated. You can see here, talking with these people and seeing their faces light up, having them tell their story, where they're struggling, where they're succeeding, what's going on in their lives is so, so important. We feel so strongly that the insights you can get from 10 interviews vastly outweighs 10,000 people answering 10 questions on a survey. Some people would say, oh, let's do a survey. Yes, if we could get a thousand people to answer these 20 questions, we will for sure know what to do. Why? Because it'll be statistically significant. We can just put it in Excel. We can chart it and plot it and say, hey, most people want this feature or that, right? We believe surveys are valuable at certain stages and to answer certain types of questions. They're also extremely hard to do well, extremely hard to do well. Often, what you think you're asking is not what they think you're asking. And the problem with that is bad data in, bad data out. 
we feel that bad data is actually worse than no data at all. We believe getting 10 interviews and getting that rich storytelling on where, where my problem is, what my actual daily life is, how I'm pulling certain products in at certain times, what the challenges are in, in all of that. We believe 10 really deep, well done interviews is way more valuable, way more insightful than doing a survey with a thousand people for 20 questions. So you might ask, what does a good customer interview look like? Well, it really depends on what you're trying to learn. In this case, what we're talking about is the problem space and unpacking their daily life, what they're struggling with. And we'll talk in a minute about some great questions you can use. But talking about the problem space means that we're not talking about our solution. We're only talking about real behavior, past behavior, because past behavior is reliable. What people say they'll do in the future is not reliable. So we're not going to talk about the future. We're not going to talk about what they would do, what they might do, what they could do. We're not going to talk about your solution. We're only going to talk about past behavior and what their current problems and challenges are. The best customer interviews revolve around stories. You can see here the people in, in the picture are just talking. They're just going. They're retelling and replaying these moments, these moments that made them uh, happy in some cases, and they're laughing. Some cases, it made them sad, and they're frustrated, and they're retelling the, the pain. So we're going to make sure that we unpack the stories in customers' lives. Now, if you don't have any customers, that's okay. We're using the word customer interview. We're using that term broadly. These are potential customers. They could be in your target audience someday, right? They don't have to be customers now. You don't have to have a product at all to do these interviews. This is just unpacking their stories and getting them to storytell and, and talk about where their challenges are and where they're struggling. So what questions can I use to really dive into these customer stories? There are so many. What I'm going to do is give you some to help you go in the right direction. Now, you already know that there's a general problem area that you're going to be exploring with these people. First of all, start off with context. Hey, where are you from? You know, what do you do? Just get to know them a little bit. A little bit of context is really, really helpful place to start. It's always really important to make them feel comfortable. I always try to let the person know, hey, there's no wrong answers here. We're just going to unpack and talk about your story. And if you ever get uncomfortable, let me know. To really start unpacking their story, one of the best questions and prompts you can do for them is say, hey, when was the last time X, Y, Z? When was the last time this happened? When was the last time you had this problem? Right, because you know you have a general problem statement. You want to start there. Give them something to anchor to, to latch onto, and they will bring you back. And then you can use some, some words to, to elicit some clarity from them, to kind of refresh their memory, kind of rejog them. And you can ask things like, hey, how long ago was that? Was that last week? Was that last month? Was that a weekday or weekend? Was that spring, summer, or fall? Who was with you? Where were they? You're trying to jog their memory. Once they start talking about their story, let them go. Let them go in a bunch of different directions. It's okay for it to be messy. You don't have to follow a script exactly. Go where the emotion is. Go where the pain is. Go where their desires are. And then and be curious. Hey, why'd you do this and not that? Right? Ask them, um, I don't understand. I'm confused. You said this, but now you're saying this. Really get curious and unpack their story and get them to clarify for you what's really going on. And then talk about the context. When does that happen? How often? Then talk about the impact of that. What, what, who's that hurting? What's the repercussions of that? Why is that a problem? Why is that so important to get solved? Who is that impacting in the business and in your life? Trying to understand, well, hey, how have you tried, if that's really a problem, how have you tried to solve that? Which solutions did you consider? Well, I considered, considered this and this and this, and I chose that. Well, why'd you choose that solution? How do you compare and contrast which one to choose? That's really valuable when you get to understand the trade-offs between these solutions. You can also get into channels. Hey, how'd you hear about this one and this one and this one? Well, my friend told me. Oh, or I heard about this through this magazine or, or whatever. Those are really important to understand how they're making decisions how they're navigating the market space, because you have to realize that your product is probably going to be solution number four, right? And to win there, you have to understand how they're selecting solutions one, two, and three today. You also want to understand what are they heading towards? Hey, what are you trying to accomplish here? If this problem were solved, what would it enable you to do? 
right? You want to understand where they're coming from, the, the, the pain they're trying to avoid, move away from. You're trying to understand how they navigate their way through that. And you're really trying to understand what they're trying to achieve, what they're, where they're trying to go, how they're being measured, what, what numbers they have to hit. Once you have those forces together, then you can really get to a specific problem and say, hey, the competitors are really, they're really not fitting here. There's an opportunity here for us. And you have messaging for the pain they're going through, what they're trying to achieve, and how you can win in the market. When you do a number of these interviews, you're going to want to put them all together. So how do I gather my insights? How do I collect all this stuff? They're getting such great content out of these interviews. What we do is we actually take notes live. You can see day one, we did two interviews. And during those interviews, we are live note taking. Boom, 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 boom. And we're getting categories. You can think of some of these categories where what they're trying to move away from, what they're trying to move towards, how they're comparing and contrasting these solutions. Those are all categories. And we have many more depending on the exact interview and, and what the context is. But we're taking those notes live. Every card has a place to live. And we do that multiple times. You can see we're doing multiple interviews a day. Day one, two interviews. Day three, day two and three, three interviews each. Day four, doing another one, right? We're getting here nine interviews in four days and we're learning so much. What this allows you to do when you take notes in this way, it allows you to start putting them all together and coming into those insights and really deciding on, hey, there's themes here, there's patterns here. And that's what you're gonna need to go from a generic problem to a specific problem that you can take to market. Well, I hope that was helpful for everyone. Um, you know, customer research, customer discovery is really like, it's one of my favorite topics because I think it's one of the most um, impactful things you can do for any new product. Um, better understanding the customer, the market, where to play is such a huge thing and that, that ends up being your strategy. Um, and we often find that people don't value this enough. You know, we kind of, we, we talk a lot about it, but um, it's so important to know that why customer research? Customer research is so important in, in bringing something new into the world because it has to have, you know, you're, you're asking for people to change their behavior, to leave what they're doing and to start doing something new. And that means you really have to, to be able to fit into their lives and, and understand what they're pulling in and, and, um, and to make space, to really make a, a spot for yourself, it's really important to understand the market. Um, it's less about your solution. So today we're really talking about customer research. Hey, how do I do it? What's the flow? What are some examples? Um, we really, you know, this is open offers hours. So we fully welcome questions, put it in the chat and we will get to it um, as, as, you know, as soon as possible right away if we can. So, all right, let's jump into some, um, some points that were in the video, or maybe even go a little bit deeper, maybe give you a little bit of more takeaways that are, that are tangible for you. So anytime we're doing customer research, we're kind of flowing through these, um, these seven steps. We're doing a research project. Um, first thing is research question. This is the most important thing that, that, that we're gonna talk about today is, is you nailing what research question, because that's gonna impact all the different steps below it. Um, then we'll talk about recruiting and sampling. Maybe how do, I, how do I get people to talk to me and how many do I have to talk to? Um, where can I find them? Uh, we, can, we can touch on those things. Discussion guide, what questions do I ask and how should that flow and you know, the, the actual interview itself. Um, then we'll, we'll look at a, a debrief and kind of like taking a step back and, and reviewing after the interview and, and thinking, you know, did I ask the right questions and I missed everything? What did I hear? Um, what are the takeaways? And we'll also look at, uh, we'll touch on synthesis and, and now that you've done a couple of interviews, many interviews, synthesizing those things and bringing them together. And, and Jacob, you've been doing this lately with some of our, even our, our marketing research, uh, customer research we're doing. Um, and then it brings you down to, 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 to step seven, which is getting to a decision and updating, updating what you think to be true so that you can do, you can do and move on to the next um, the next big question to answer uh, for your startup or for your new product. So those are the seven things we're going to be walking through today. Again, put any questions you have as we're going through this in the um, uh, in the comment box, in the chat box, and we'll we'll get to we'll get to answer those. 
So we're going to touch on the most important thing first, which is the research question. If you don't get this right, everything, nothing else matters. Uh, we talk a lot about prioritizing risk and making sure that we we're asking the right questions. Um, you know, Clayton Christensen talks about this. Um, he talks about the that a question is a place in the mind where an answer can live. Right. And so the first thing to, to, to ask ourselves is, hey, are we asking the right questions? What are we really trying to learn here? And there's two types of learning. The two types of learning are generative and evaluative. Now, these sounds this sounds pretty theoretical, but it actually is very practical. So let's take generative. Generative is a type of learning where we're actually wanting to to just be like really curious, we're trying to discover, we're trying to explore, we're trying to understand, we're trying to, to get into people's stories and lives and, and, and really expand our understanding. That's why it's expansive here. Um, we mentioned design thinking. Design thinking is really about expanding our thinking, learning more really, and then making those conclusions coming in and then moving into evaluative. And in this on this side of the learning, it's taking what we've learned and we think that this is this is the this is the real problem people have. We think this is the solution that people want. And it's actually going out and testing those things, testing our assumptions, confirming that if if we've made the right selection here, confirming we understand their world and validating that. And depending on, you know, if you're trying to learn about the problem or you're trying to validate the problem, you're gonna ask different things, you're gonna ask different questions, you're gonna approach it very differently, right? So when we take this uh, two types of learning and kind of apply it to the, the timeline, if you will, or the steps in bringing a new product to market, it kind of ends up looking like this. Now, it's a, not a perfect model, but the idea is first you want to understand, gee, am, am I in the right – Am I which market do I go after? Am I targeting the right customer segment? Is this customer segment – are they going to get me to my financial goals? Like these are all – these are all questions um, – the next thing is if I have a segment, then do I understand their problem? You know, on this, on the generative side, what is their problem? What's their most important things that, they, that they're trying to solve for right now? What's their top priorities? What impact does that have? And then on the, on the right-hand side, which is the evaluative side of the problem, is then going to talk to more people to validate, oh, oh that, is definitely the that is definitely what's on my mind. That would definitely, um, I need to find a solution for that. Are people shopping for those things? Value proposition, right? Like, what what do people desire? There, we can we can do entire research on on that, and then we can also validate that. Hey, do they want what I have? Um, and then will they actually purchase it? Can I deliver value to the first customer, like zero to one? Can you go from one one you know no customers to one success story, and then retention? And We've done we've done work in all of these different phases, and we help bring companies from apps from, from you know zero all the way through these. And what you'll find is that the research never ends. I don't want you to look at these seven steps and be like, "Hey, I just need to go do ten interviews that we said in the video, and then I'm done." Right? Um, actually, no. You're going to be flowing through this entire uh, journey, and you're going to be learning you're going to be asking new questions every week, right? And that's the way it should be. And there's a word for this. There's a name for this. It's called continuous discovery. So your learning never ends. Just the questions keep changing as you move. Awesome. So before we, before we jump into this questions? though, there's a quick yeah. question that came in. Yeah. I'm just going to share it here. Um, so how many people from the research team are there for the interviews and what have you found to be the most optimal? This is a great question. Um, so, you know, sometimes you have to do the interviews alone and uh, it's not ideal. We, we, we recognize that, you know, the hard thing about being alone in, in, in these interviews is, you know, we all come from different spaces, from, from different, different perspectives, and we all kind of have different takes on things. So being alone, yeah, you can, you can do it and you can still get there. You can still get the insights, but, you know, there's no one to... Um, there's no one to debrief with. And I think that's really hard because um, I thought he said, I thought they said this. No, I thought they said this. I think that means that. Oh, I didn't hear it that way. Or I missed that. What did you catch that I didn't? And you find that actually having multiple people 
um, in a customer interview is really, really valuable and really helpful. One, because it allows the person that's asking and leading the conversation, the questions to kind of let let up a bit on note taking. We, we try to do live note taking because it's just, it's really efficient and we get to understand what, what, what we have and haven't asked. Um, and if you have a second person there, then you kind of like take these specialty roles during the interview where the, the observer, the second person is mostly helping to take notes. Uh, the other persons that allows them to, uh, as an interview, as the person interviewing to really stay engaged in the conversation. Otherwise there's kind of this pause where, Oh, hold on a second. Could you repeat that? Cause I'm taking a note and like you, you definitely want to minimize that. Um, but I think I think the the other perspective is a really valuable thing. You know, in modern product teams, we talk about is um, you know you have you have squads, you have entire teams that are that are that are cross functional, and, and the cross functional component is is really important. So um, the ideal is you're going to have a product manager, a designer, and your tech lead, uh, someone from the that represents the development team, kind of all three engage in these conversations. I know it's not always possible, but that's the, that's the ideal. Um, I think the, the tech perspective is really important because the tech perspective answers, how, how could we solve that using the assets we have, using, you know, knowing what's actually possible on the tech side is really valuable to say, uh, to understand what might be coming through, how might we solve for those challenges or things we're hearing. Um, whereas the design design team and product product might not always know those technical cap capabilities. Um, I think another thing is if we just do research by ourselves and then go pass those insights to the design team, there's just this huge learning curve. The design, you know, designer is going to ask, well, what are they really struggling with? And there's this, this loss of, of empathy transfer. So for sure what we do is we, we definitely have a strategist and a designer pairing in interviews together. And we do pull in a, a tech lead to kind of figure out, definitely in the solutioning side, um, we'll pull them along in, our, in, in some of our project kickoffs. So there's context there. Um, but I hope that answers your question. It's, it's, it's ideal to not be alone for, uh, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I can speak from personal experience like, just having one other person where, hey, there's someone leading the interview, the other person maybe, you know, in the background a little bit, just taking the notes, and they might chime in, like, I would sometimes I'll chime in, like, if I'm taking notes, and because sometimes, you know, that that different perspective is good, like, oh, the person leading the interview heard this, but then I heard this. And that's that that can be super valuable. So um, but yeah, it's like, there is no like, perfect answer to that because it just do what you can with the best you have. And, and again, you can kind of read the room if there's too many people on the call and they're feeling, you know, like kind of like they're not sharing everything. They, they, don't, they feel uh, kind of held like they're holding stuff back, then revisit like, Hey, we have too many people on the call. Maybe we do need to change this up. So yeah, great answer, Ryan. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for the question today. So awesome. Yeah. And I totally agree, Jacob, you know, as it, it's not just, if you have two people in an interview, um, one shouldn't just be asking questions and the other one only be taking notes for sure. It's meant to be collaborative. Like, Oh, Hey, I have a question right. And, and chime in. Did you mean this? And, and that's, that's really, really good so that we get, we, we maximize the, um, the learning from, from each of the interviews. Mm -hmm. So, and I have also on that note, you know, when we're in like client engagements, um, frankly, you know, having, you know, our team in on interviews is one thing. Uh, we also try to pull in client, the client into, into those interviews because the empathy transfer is so valuable. Um, you know, we've seen that time and time again, that the person, um, from the client that that's in these interviews becomes like this proponent for, 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 for customer research and this proponent for, for the market and actually being able to share those insights and, and, and communicate to people um, what's going on in the, re in the real world, kind of bringing it back and being a voice internally, which is um, really, really important. It's, it's, mm -hmm. and then, you know, we also, you know, we'll talk about this later, but um, when we're talking about influencing, I think it's really important that we, you know, it's one thing for, for us to say, Hey, this is the conclusion. It's another thing. And it's like, well, sure. That's, that's just your opinion. Right. 
I think it, one thing that we really try to do is we take these interviews and we try to chop them up into little video highlights. And that I was way, just going to bring you know, that up. You already did I think <laughs> that's a really, really big thing. Um, because what we're talking about here is empathy transfer, right? How do you, you're not going to have your entire company. You're not going to have everyone in an interview. So how do you, how do you communicate and bring people into the, to their pain, bring people, bring your, your, your team into the, uh, the challenges or what you're hearing. And so mm -hmm. what we'll try to do is we'll actually get these highlight reels going and then we'll be able to share out, um, you know, these, high, so you don't have to listen to an entire thing, but you can get the, the key snippets. Um, and it's so valuable hearing it come from the customer themselves. It allows your teams to, you know, uh, to absorb all of the stuff you've been learning, which is, which yeah. is awesome. And, and it's so different to read, Hey, here's, you know, the proposed things we learned. It's like just text. But when you hear like someone's tone of voice and you see their body language and they're talking about it, then it starts to click even more and it's like, it has more weight to it. So yeah, totally love it. All right, Ryan, I think we can move forward. Yeah, sounds good. So there are example, um, different types of interviews, you know, there's, there's a lot of different ones and it's all contextual based on what you want to learn. So the questions you're going to ask who you're going to interview, um, all depends on what you're trying to learn. So what I did was for this, I, <laughs> done all of these things and many, many more, but I put some of the big ones up here that might be helpful to you to think about, you know, where are you coming from? What are you trying to learn? Kind of map yourself to some of these things. And hopefully you'll be able to gravitate towards, towards at least one of these with some takeaways like, oh, that's what I need to go do right now. Um, so let's, let's step through some of these. One is, hey, where's the opportunity in the market? Um, this is a really big one. A lot of times it's all these things usually get skipped over to tell you the truth, but this, this stuff's so valuable and in anchoring into some of these questions and being able to answer them. So this research question is where in the, where in, where is the opportunity in this market? Um, and when we're talking market level, we're not talking within a certain customer. We're talking market, think ecosystem, right? So what I've done in the past is actually, um, you know, not interviewed single customers, but actually interview market experts. So whether it's consultants or industry leaders or thought leaders in the space, and and uh, that would call like a it's a, it's a proxy. It's a proxy for the entire market because they can see across all these different types of companies that are that are that are involved in 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 the market. So um, I'd be thinking about trying to build, trying to trying to learn enough to build out. A market ecosystem diagram. Hey, there's this, there's these, you know, seven types of companies. They're connected in these ways. Data flows this way, then it goes here, then it goes here, then it goes here. Follow the money around, follow the data around, and you get to build this map of like, like healthcare be one. Like we did some in um, health payments. Like it's a complicated space. This is not simple stuff. It's not just one company doing these things. It's all these different companies involved. And so if you're asking yourself, hey, where where do my where am I going to go play? Where's the best spot for me to in, in, insert myself? Um, you know, those are things we 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 think about understanding, um, building a market ecosystem diagram, and and then you start to think about well, that flow, what's upstream and what's downstream, and in a strategy kind of approach, you end up finding well, I don't really want to be at the at the at the all the way downstream because then I have no influence. Everyone before me is doing all the all the all the decision making. So if I move up higher in that in that flow, then I can cut people off. I can direct flows of data and money. And it's like that's kind of answering um, this question of hey, where's the opportunity in the market? And when you do those those questions, you're not going to be interviewing specific um, you know one customer segment. You're going to be interviewing different people across the entire market to just get a view of of the whole space. Another one is hey, what's the user's current workflow, right? So this is a single company. It's a single type of type of user, probably even in that company. What's their, what's their workflow? So this type of research is, is a lot more observational. It's, hey, let me sit down. Can I just sit down and, and you walk me through that? Hey, show me how you do this. Them sharing their screen, them showing you, I go to this system, this system, this system. I do this, then I do this, then I do this. And you get this kind of like understanding of, of, of their journey, of their day, right? And you also want to understand when, you know, 
what's the beginning of this flow? Oh, when this happens, then I go do this. But when this happens, I do something else. Oh, there's multiple flows here. This is, this is sitting down and kind of just watching someone work, asking questions. Hey, what happens? What happens before, um, before something gets to you? What ha when you're done with it, what happens after, after <clears throat> you're going to start to see how all these things are connected. And then you want to ask things about, Hey, how do you decide what to do? How do you decide? Why do you pull this system up instead of going here sometimes? And you realize there's these, there's these critical kind of like decisions that they're trying to understand or make. And really all the screens they're using, they might be using a really complicated screen. But they, they know that there's only two fields they need to look for. We've seen this time and time again in logistics. There's a million different data points, but they're, all, they're, they're, they're skilled enough to only look at for a couple things. What are the decisions they need to make? And what couple of fields or what things are they using to, to make that decision? Right? So that, that'll, that, that's often something that we start with. And hey, understanding the problem space, right? And then we think about, okay, maybe you're trying to figure out what causes people to buy like a competitor product. Why are people buying a competitor product? Um, or why, why are people buying product X versus versus Y? Um, this is, this is, I can't tell you how, how impactful this type of interview is. It's called a job, job to be done switch interview. And there's so much value that comes out of something like this. It, you'll be, you'll get to understand, you know, what you're going to go into their story and really understand and rewind. Hey, when did you buy this thing? And then rewind, bring me back to the first moment that you, that you, that you realized that something that what you had wasn't working that first moment. Then they can replay that entire journey to journey to you. Well, this happened, then this happened, then this broke. <laughs> then I needed to go shopping. Like it happened with my fridge, like my, you know, <clears throat> part of our fridge broke. And then the handle broke, the handle broke on our fridge. It's like, okay, now I need to go shopping, right? So what are those key things that actually cause people to hit the market to go shopping? Then how do they navigate? How do they navigate the different, the different options out there? Like we said in the video, there will be three options out there. They're trying to decide between the three. And if you're going to be option number four, you've got to understand how they're making that selection process, right? How are they deciding between these things? What do they look for? Um, how do they compare and contrast the different different competitors, right? You understanding their buying decision, their buying process is super important. So for, for an interview like this, I would actually interview people that have recently purchased that new product or a competitor product and understand their journey, what drove them through, how they may, how they navigate the space, where they hear about stuff, you learn about channels, um, but you're going to be interviewing people who've recently switched to a new product. Um, does my value prop resonate? So if you have a new, a new idea, a lot of times this is where you're going to be at. Hey, can I go pitch and sell my, sell my thing? Um, and even before you go into immediate sales, sales will be the next step after this. We suggest doing um, <clears throat> just does my value prop, like does it click with people? Does it resonate? Does it get them excited? Do I understand the problems leading up to that? Does, does my, does this, does, in there, in the customer's mind, does this solve their problem? So here we've done something called simulated shopping. Feel free to check one of our exploring product episodes out where we do a deep dive in just, in just simulated shopping and perception testing, uh, positioning and pricing. But you're really trying to understand here is you're going to be trying to interview your target customer <clears throat> and understand, um, do they have the problem? Do I have that right? And then when I put the solution in front of them, does it get them excited? And just think about like the top half of your landing page or your homepage, what would be the first top section and put that in front of them? Does that get them excited? Like, yeah, that sounds amazing. Do you have the positioning right? So we can get into all these things in way more detail if, if any of this stuff, um, if any of these questions is specific things that you're thinking through right now. Another one is, what features might realize our vision? So we had a client that had a vision to, to help, um, help this type of customer in this way or get to this end space. And what we actually did was we didn't know, quite know what features would actually help customers. So what we did was we actually did a um, reverse engineering in our customer research. So what we did was we actually interviewed customers that had made it to the end of the rainbow. Kind of think of a rainbow. Like there's a pot of gold over here and there's where you are right now over here. And there's that, that journey to get to the end of the rainbow, the Skittles, right? The pot of gold. 
we actually, in this case, we interview customers that had reached the pot of gold, that had gotten to success. And they got there all different ways, but we talked to them and then rewound their journey and had them replay how they went from this kind of like really troubled area in their <clears throat> in their lives to to this new space. They'd made it across. So we re actually reverse engineered it by talking to customers that made it across and had success. And then we figured out how they made their way out of that painful area in their life. And we realized that, wow, these couple things are really, really key. And if we can get customers there, they'll get, they're much more likely to get the whole way. And those are called magic moments. So listening for these magic moments on their journey. But you'll notice a lot of the stuff that we're talking about now in, in all of this, um, most of it is story-based. Hey, tell me the last time. Tell me how you got from here to here. Bring me, Ryan, bring me back. And because as, 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 as humans, I think that we, we remember stories. We love, why do we love movies? Why do we love dramas? Stories, everything to, to us. And so that's how we remember too. First this happened and then, and then we paint this picture of this arc. Um, we want to get into those stories with customers. You'll get into these magic moments. You'll get to their pains. You'll get to their struggles. You get to what their hopes are. And it's really that arc is um, a common common pattern we, we use and try to work into a lot of these interviews. And the last one here I'm going to mention is if you already have a product, we've had customers come to us and say, hey, you know, I'm selling a ton of my product. Everyone loves the idea of it. They buy it. But then, but then like everyone hates it. <laughs> You know, it's not what they were hoping for. It, it's, it's, I want, I expected more. And so you, the, the question here is, okay, how do I, how do I increase retention? And we are going to be doing here is you're going to be actually interviewing real customers, not potential customers, but your, your past customers. And you're going to interview uh, two different types of people. One is a group of people that have been really successful with your product. Even though it might not be many, you want to understand who's been successful. And then you want to understand who's actually been struggling and who who's left and who's really mad. Um, and you could use like MPS score to indicate some of these um, but or engagement levels. And then you want to interview those two types of customers and contrast their stories because the learning, the learning for you is really going to happen in the contrast between two things, right? So you're going to learn the difference between what makes customers successful and what makes customers fail. Maybe it's maybe it's maybe it's not a product problem. Maybe it's a customer segment problem. People who are in this situation, it really really works well for. But people in this situation, it really doesn't. And we actually found that. We actually found that, you know, people that were coming in through this channel um, had much different expectations for your product, and they were a lot lot higher because of their previous experience. So people came from from this channel. The previous product they'd used was really horrible, and so like what we what, what was being offered was actually very like was a delight to them. So there's lots to learn um, in all of these. There's so much to do with customer research and what questions we ask. But I hope some of this is prompting some of you to think about, hey, what what do I want to learn about? And then we're happy to to drill into anything in detail. Jacob, do we have any questions yet? No, nothing new from before. So uh, yeah, but if anybody has any questions, feel free to, to drop them in the chat um, and we'll answer them. But I think we can move along. We got about 20 minutes left. Uh, and so hopefully we can get to the rest of the stuff. Sure. Um, yeah, some of, the, some of the things you'll notice what's different between each of these is who we're interviewing is very, very different, <laughs> right? Here we're in, in the uh, understanding the market, the ecosystem, where's the opportunity, where do I play? We're not interviewing potential customers. We're interviewing market experts. We're way up on the macro level, just trying to map the space, right? In switch interviews, we're trying to interview people that have already, you know, recently purchased something. It's kind of similar to the reverse engineering, people that have recently made it to the end of the rainbow um, versus customers, you know, that you're, you actually have that are in, in real, like they love it, they hate it. You want to know what the difference is here, um, you know, Understanding current users' workflow; those are potential customers. They don't have to. You don't even have to talk about your solution at all. You're just trying to understand um, where they are right now. So, depending on what you're trying to learn, greatly changes 
who you interview, um, it re in, in impacts your recruiting, impacts how many you probably want to talk to. Um, so recruiting and sampling, we kind of talked about um, some of this, but I would I think there's kind of like three types of people at a high level that you could interview. One are those experts, which is we call them like a, a proxy, a proxy customer. They can kind of represent multiple customers. Um, another one is a um, customer proxy. And this is like, you know, it's a, it's a potential customer, but they're not probably not really, really in the buying mode right now. Um, but we, you can find these. So we use something called respondent or userinterviews.com to recruit. So you can actually, you know, put a request to talk to certain types of people. Um, Jacob, we also use, you know, for some of our, um, unmoderated work with our landing pages. We use something called Winter. It's also pulling from a panel. So these are people that you actually pay to come talk to you, right? It's called a panel. So that's the second type of interview, uh, uh, like source. And the third type of, um, you know, um, recruiting source would be actual customers, people that are actually flowing through your, your marketing funnel, your sales funnel, people that are signing up for your email lists, um, but, you know, actual customers right now. So we have market proxies, we have panels, and we have actual customers. They're kind of like the three high level here. Let's go to the next one. So discussion guide. Again, what you're trying to learn is really gonna shape this, but we think it's really important to think about the questions ahead of time. Think about what you're trying to learn, and then you you really wanna make sure that you're 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 not biasing these questions, that you're you're being open about them. Hey, tell me about right uh, certain situations, and and asking open-ended questions. Maybe that's an obvious one. Open-ended questions, not yes/no questions. Um, you, you know, you you know when it's working when they're doing you know 95% of the talking and you're doing all the listening. Now, I will say that you know in trying to train someone to do really good customer research, it's hard, and you're you're. You're going to learn as you go, but you just need to do it. Um, when you're when you're thinking about customer customer interviews in steps three and four, um, there's actually kind of two pieces here. One is the discussion guide, and the discussion guide is going to surface the information by asking the right questions. The other thing is capturing and capturing and what to listen for when they're talking. Hey, what do I pull out of this? What 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 notes? What do I take notes on? What do I just ignore? Right. So they're surfacing the right information. That's a discussion guide and then capturing. And as you do more and more of these, you'll get a better ear for what to be listening for. But we can definitely help with some questions to start with, um, depending on what we're what, we, what you're trying to learn. Um, and we'll we'll cover some of those some of those uh, right here on the interviews. So here's some simple do's and don'ts. Um, you know, one thing we suggest is doing interviews one on one and not doing focus groups. We think one-on-one -on -one interviews are really important because we talk so much about stories. You don't get that opportunity in a focus group. In a focus group, you start to get, you know, three people in a room, and three's a crowd, and, you know, one person's really loud and, and dominating the conversation, and you're really not being able to listen to individual people. You start to get groupthink. So that's one thing to say is, you know, we're going to be doing one-on-one -on -one interviews, and you're, you know, like we said in the video, you're not going to be asking would you questions, not future questions. You're going to be asking what they do right now, what they have done, what they are doing, because that stuff's reliable. And when you're asking about, it's going to be hard, but the reason why we ask about stories is because you want to go deep into their actual life. Um, <clears throat> if you try to ask things like, what do you usually do? You know, we kind of see this in, in people that are new to interviewing. What do you usually do? Um, well, Jacob, what do you usually have for lunch? I usually have um, soup or a sandwich. <laughs> now, I already know Jacob's lying because if I <laughs> asked him, if I asked him what, what he had like, you know, nine days ago for lunch, he couldn't tell me. If I have, if I, Jacob, if I asked you, you don't have to answer this, but like yeah, day, before, day before that, day before that, what'd you have for lunch? Day before that, like, right? If we can't even remember what we had for lunch three days ago, um, aggregating all these things into once, like humans aren't computers. 
And you can't you can't just run an Excel macro like you think you could on a on a on a spreadsheet, right? So like you can do that kind of stuff with data, but you can't work that way with people and, and their memory. So the important thing to do is to get into individual stories. And once you do that, once you get them into a real story, then you can ask things like, how's that different from the other times you do it? Because now they have something to anchor to. Now you have some kind of re reality to talk about. Um, so getting into stories and asking, you know, tell me the last time that happened. Tell me, tell me more and really getting curious, right? We talked about jogging their memory and, um, you know, does that happen in morning or afternoon? Does it happen every week? Um, right. You're going to be just jogging their memory. Um, yeah. And I've gotten, it's the cool thing. I've uh, Jacob, I've even gotten people that, you know, we did one of the a switch interview, someone who bought something, probably like two years prior. Now this is a stretch. I don't recommend doing this, but I, you know, I was able to get, maybe it was a year and a half prior. I was able to get them to tell me where they were. They knew they were sitting in their car. They knew they were at the, picking their wife up from work, sitting in the car, picking their wife up from work, picked his phone up and boom, this email hit. He was right then thinking about, do I have time to look at this now? How soon she kind of come out? Like, and then I got to in this, I got, to, we got into this imagination, like, Hey, when you saw that email come up, what were you, what were you expecting when you, before you clicked on it, what were you hoping to see? What are you expecting to find? Right. And you get into their imagination and you get to compare these contrasts between what they thought they were getting themselves, what they thought that experience would be like. So unpacking their imagination, once you have them remembering where they were, Oh, I, I thought I thought it'd be like this, but then when I got there, it was actually this. And then it's like, well, what the heck? Because the, the the dichotomy or the the gap between expectations and and what you're actually delivering can really frustrate people, right? So you want to understand um, what what they're hoping for, what they're imagining, what their expectations are the whole way through. Um, yeah. So you want to get curious and understand, but but not get locked in. We'd mentioned discussion guide. Don't get locked into it. You know, you just got you just got to flow, right? If they take you to a to a new place, that's interesting. Why? Um, what makes us? What makes you think about talking about this? Like that's kind of cool. Get curious and follow the emotion. Just go with it. Tell me more about that. If they get all riled up, if they get if they start smiling and or or, or they get angry, whatever. That's what you want to drill into. Tell me more about that. You know, and then be confused when when they say some things that don't make sense. You know, why'd you do this but not that? I, I, help me understand those kinds of things. Um, and you're gonna help. You're gonna you're gonna get a lot more clarity by asking. But just just beginner mindset things. I think I think the part of it is we come in and we we try to position ourselves. Oh, I'm worth talking to because this and and we don't want to posture ourselves. As, as if we, we are also like a, a peer to them, like we're also an expert. Um, we, wanna, we wanna make them the perceived expert in the conversation because our goal really is to, to learn. And if we, if we try to position ourselves that, that we know what we're talking about, then it becomes less about them, more about us. And then, and then it actually, <laughs> I actually enjoy going into new domains because it's okay to ask dumb questions where if you've been in the industry for 10, 15 years and you, you kind of feel dumb, maybe, you know, um, how's it actually, how does it actually work? You, you know, um, so you want to, you want to start the conversation off with just beginner's mindset. Hey, th this is your story. You're the expert here. Just loving to hear how, how you work. Um, just to hear your story and your journey. Um, yeah. So those are, so those are some touch points. Yeah, I'm just gonna say something. So I feel like I'm kind of still, you know, new to customer interviews and stuff. And I've and I've done a couple podcasts in the past of my own where I've interviewed people. And I think like the biggest thing that I've learned is like when when you do ask a question and then they have an answer, sometimes asking, hey, when that happened or when you do that thing, how does that make you feel? And sometimes like mm, that that yeah. question has really helped me unpack a lot more um nuance and like actual the why, like, like, you know, why they made those decisions. Sometimes it's that emotional attachment and like, and then it might unpack, like all of a sudden there's social influence. They didn't realize like, Oh, well I was frustrated because I was concerned that my friends would like blah, blah, blah. Right. Like 
there's a, there's a lot you can get out of that. So, and I actually learned that from a uh, like a video production uh, course that I took on how to do better interviews when you're making videos and stuff. And I was like, oh, that's such a good question. How did that make you feel when that thing happened? Mm. So, yeah, yeah, that's really good. Yeah, it's it's you know we don't make decisions. People, customers, people don't make decisions just done on rationale, on logic, right? Like, or emotional beings totally tap into that emotion. And what were you feeling at the time? You know, what, how did that make you feel, Jacob? Those are, those are excellent questions. I've actually been in interviews when like what we were talking about was so personal and the solution that we started to show, um, as we had her walk through it struck so many chords she started bawling like she started crying and it's like yeah this is this is real <laughs> you know uh, that's not going to happen it's been you know 20 you know 15 20 years and it, it doesn't happen uh, very often but yeah like, and, yes, and, and you can get the really opposite too you can get people super excited like actually i was so pumped yeah. for, like to know that like this thing was happening or whatever they want to say so um it can be it can be either or and, and both of those whether it's super a super like you know emotionally tearing up type of thing or a super energetic excitement like those are both good signals so yeah yeah and, and another one is like just monotone like meh, mm -hmm. right like yeah okay well, we're talking good either right yeah. neutral's not good like you want right. to get to yeah. you want to get to some either like you want to get them angry you want to get them excited but the neutral's bad so mm -hmm. if if you're feeling that in in the conversation flow then just pause and say like Hey, maybe this is this stuff. Maybe this isn't the most important thing going on for you right now. Like, what is? Like, where does this fall on your list of priorities? Ten. All right. What's one, two, three? <laughs> right. And actually, like, pivoting away from what you think might have been valuable to what what's valuable to them um, is really something important. I like that. The neutral. Stay away from neutral. Yeah, because really like generous. sometimes too. Sometimes like the tone can come from their body language. Like if they do a big exhale, like, and then they explain, it's like, you can feel that frustration. You're like, whoa, there's, they're not maybe saying the words, but you can tell by that huge exhale, their body language, all that stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, for sure. So I hope this stuff, some, uh, some of this stuff is valuable to, um, to you guys. So the, the next one is, is debrief. So you've done your first interviews and after after each one of them, what I suggest you doing is is doing a debrief and stepping back with you and the other person that have been doing the interview and asking yourselves two groups of questions. One is, hey, what did we observe? So these are observations. Observations is about, hey, what what did they say? What didn't they say? And you might actually find out that what didn't they say is pretty valuable. Oh, I thought they'd talk about this, but they never did. Maybe that's not top of mind for them, right? What what surprised you? So you're starting to think about um, after the interview, what surprised you? When did they light up? When did they get emotional? When did um, you know what didn't what didn't they say? All those things. Those are observations. That's going to lead you to the second half of debrief, which is insights. Wow, what are our key takeaways? What are the key things that we think this is really really interesting? Um, so those those debriefs after each interview are going to help you feed right into summarizing all of those together in in synthesis. We have a comment from Joe. Yeah, awesome. Um, I, I love that he shared like you know acting like you don't know anything here to learn. Uh, you know feel like a valued expert and gives them the freedom to keep asking why. And, and I love that he talks about getting to the heart of the problem because that's where like the real feelings are. Like, how do you actually feel about that thing deep inside your heart? Let's get rid of all the logic up here. Like, what's the true mm -hmm. feeling that you that you have with this thing? Love it. Yeah, totally. Yeah, Joe, great comment. I love the beginner's mindset here and in trying to chase the value, trying to get to the why, trying to get to the heart of it. So true. Um, yeah, great comment. Thanks, Joe. And then, so you've done it. You've done a number of interviews. You've debriefed after each one. And then what you need to do is, is kind of put those together and think to yourself, 
how do I pull all these together? Maybe you've done 10. And something, you know, something we also get questions on, Jacob, is how many interviews do I have to do? You know, you got people that do none, which is most people. You have some people that actually do get out of the building and they get they get to 10, which is super awesome. And you have other people that do like, do I have to do 100? Some people have done 100. Um, and well, I, I, I congratulate the person who's done who's done that many because the questions that you need to learn just keep changing, right? So like the learning never stops. I think for a specific, for a single research question, um, it it depends. You know, I'll give you some examples. When when I've done like new stuff um, in a totally new space, and like they want to launch a brand new product, and it's on me to figure out like what do we build like where's the opportunity in the market oh my gosh it's overwhelming right maybe you feel as way as a founder like i want to make my vision real but am, am i in the right space and if you're going to actually take that step back and, and and with a beginner's mindset and learn how the pattern that i've noticed have happened is that you do what i've done is i've learned to do it this way do the first three interviews with the, as you know and just let them go to all different places just let them go and follow them where they take you um within the kind of like the scope of your research question and man after those three interviews i will feel totally overwhelmed and i have no idea what's going on i don't know up from down but then you start to start to like synthesize just the first three you can go to step six here just after three interviews and and start to peel those together and look for patterns and Oh, and then you realize that, hey, this, the conversation, then you kind of build yourself a little map of the conversation. Cause then it, it makes the rest of the interviews a lot easier. And what happens is you get to use that kind of map um, to, to determine, you know, oh, I, I, it's, you know, I'm 30 minutes into a, in an interview. I haven't talked about this yet. I need to go talk about this. So that map is really helpful. Um, but then, you know, I'll be so confused for the next like week, week and a half, and then something magical magical will happen like week two, week two and a half, which is boom, I'll be in an interview and all of a sudden stuff starts to click and I can and I and I I know what the person's gonna say before they say it. I can predict exactly what they're gonna say. Oh, you told me this, which means you're going here. And that's exactly what happens. Oh. I got it, right? I've seen this move before and you start to like all the patterns start to become part of you. And, and that's called, we call that uh, saturation. So when you've kind of like reached the edges, reached the bounds of, the, of that research circle, if you will, like I've got to the edges, I'm hearing the same things over and over, I'm done, right? When you hit those patterns, when you feel like you, those things start to click and you can predict what people are gonna say, um, that's how you know when you're, when you can, uh, when you can really make a decision. And that is step seven is, is making a decision to, right? We don't do research just for fun, although it is wonderful, but it's gotta give you an answer and you have to make a decision. Okay, so I'm gonna target this customer with this problem. Here's the value prop, I'm gonna go pitch, right? And you're gonna update what you think to be true. We call that opportunity theory, where you think the opportunity is. And you're and you're going to go with it. And you're going to chase it, and you're going to move on to the next research question, essentially, which is, hey, do they value this? Right? Will they pay for it? So, that's the kind of thinking. Um, just a high level overview of, of customer research. Love Any other it. questions come in, Jacob? Yeah. So, if anyone else uh, watching, uh, we got a couple a couple minutes left. I think we can we can extend this a little bit. If there's any questions, we can take one or two before we wrap up today. Um, and as a reminder, like this one video that we showed today in this discussion is actually part of a whole video series that's free um, on our website. It's called Startup Foundations. So if you go to headway.io and go to our resources section, you'll find Startup Foundations and you get access to that. And there's there's like links and resources for each video too. So this is one of many. Um, next month, we're going to actually talk about demand testing. Um, so like, how do you go and like actually see, are people willing to put in their credit card? Are people willing to give you a letter of, of intent or, you know, write you a check and say, yeah, I'm willing to give you this amount of money so you can start making things happen and start building it. Cause I want to be a first customer. Cause this is super valuable for me and my business and the problems that we have. Um, and then in January, we're going to do rapid prototyping. So we're, we're actually going through this whole series 
um, in a live session like this. So this is uh, the third one. And so like, I would encourage you to go through those videos because then when you join us in the live stream again, like you can have better questions. Like, actually I watched it, but I still have questions about this. Um, and we, and we'll, uh, you know, obviously unpack it further together. So, um, yes, yeah, so if you have any questions, we can stick around for a couple more minutes, but, uh, yeah, thanks Ryan again for like sharing all of your wisdom and expertise today. And, uh, thanks everybody for the great questions. Um, I think, that you know that's why we're here we're here because sometimes we assume we shared everything that people want to know and then the questions come up and they're like oh yeah that's a gap in the in the conversation like that's good to talk about so i don't know ryan is there any other final thoughts you want to share i don't i don't see any questions yet but um it, but yeah no i think this is a it's a good start <clears throat> you just got to get out mm -hmm. and do them right mm -hmm. um the, the, the key thing to ask yourself is hey what do i need to learn um what do, you need to go, what do I need to go validate on that map that we showed, right? Do I really understand the problem? And maybe, maybe you do, maybe you just want to go validate your problem, right? Maybe you need to go to go pitch your, um, or see if people who are interested in it. You know, what if we, if we, we often find is that people go right to digital too fast. People will go right to, oh, I get a landing page up and I'll, you know, get, go, go get signups. Well, the problem with that is when you don't get signups or when your conversion rates not as good as you'd like, you don't really know why, right? Because the landing page, the data, Google Analytics isn't going to tell you uh, the why. So this is when we'd actually suggest even even before you do a quant test, let's say on like your value prop with a landing page and and the signups, actually get your solution in front of some customers to get some initial feedback on, hey, does does this problem resonate with you? Does, is this really where you want to go? Would this solution, would, would you think it would help you get there? What's that worth to you? Getting the pricing, like all those things are super valuable along this journey. So can't, can't say enough about customer research and how important it is to you launching the right product and being successful with your startup. Love it. We do have one, I think this is the, the we'll take this question and then we'll have to wrap up. Thanks, Joe, for another question. What are your favorite books, blogs, or articles on customer research, Ryan? This is a good question. Um, I started off with um, the mom test. Mom test was a great, great book. Um, it's all about, you know, how to, how to, <clears throat> how to get truth out of people. Um, you know, like your mom, if you ask your mom, you know, mom, do you like my thing? Do you like my thing? Oh, sure, honey. <laughs> you know, oh, sure. Right. Like how do you get the truth? Even when, even when everyone's lying to you. Right. So mm. Uh, the mom test is really good. Um, it's about framing questions in a way that'll get you to um, a truthful answer instead of a, just a, you know, an, an opinion. Um, uh, I've done a lot with Teresa Torres, followed her for many years. Mm -hmm. um, took some of her initial, you know, first classes that she offered. And I learned, I learned a ton. Um, jobs to be done. You know, there's a, there's a couple different styles for that. Um, if you follow like Bob Moesta and Job to Be Done, Job to Be Done Switch, give you a, a good anchor. Um, we also had, you know, Alan Clement on talking about simulated shopping on exploring products. So feel free to check that out as well. Love it. Awesome. I was going to say shout out to Tevin. I actually had a call with him on Sunday. It was super awesome to meet him in, in like, I guess, real Zoom life <laughs> rather than just Twitter and YouTube. Just want to say, he just wanted to say thanks for the knowledge. Uh, we appreciate you, man. Thanks for all your support. And, uh, and, and comparing us to Gary Tan's channel. I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a big deal to us that we were all, I remember when I showed the tweet to Ryan, deal. he like, he's like, no way. And he like pushed me. <laughs> we were, we were actually having dinner and it was kind of funny. Deal. So. Yeah. yeah, we we want to be providing value to to mm -hmm. founders, to startups, to anyone launching new products. Um, you know, we live and breathe this every day, so we're here with you on that journey, and we hope that um, that you'll join us for uh, you know future sessions as well, and 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 bring your comments forward, your questions forward, mm -hmm. so we can make content just 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 for you to to answer those. Yeah, and if you're watching the recording of this, because I'll I'll do a, a quick edit and we'll upload this uh, early next week, but you know, if you have any questions around this, or if you want to hear about different content from us if there's certain questions that we're not answering in the videos we upload and share in these live streams please leave a comment 
And, you know, I would love to know why you want to learn those things. And then we can, you know, help, it'll help us create new content in the future. Because again, as Ryan said, we want to make sure we're providing value and, and being super helpful. And that's, that's really what Headway is all about. You know, as much as this is like marketing for Headway or whatever, like we believe that to be as helpful as possible, like that's how we think about it. So, and again, at the end of the day, we just love supporting startups and entrepreneurs. It's like where we get our energy. We talk about that a lot. Like startups are like our jam. And, and seeing people's, you know, stories unfold and, and, you know, launch and, and all that stuff. It's just, it's, it's a wonderful thing to be a part of, you know, we're very lucky to, to build a partner with all these different founders over the last few years. Well, it's been six years now since Headway has been around. Um, we're at about 40 employees and it's, and we're, we're still growing and, but yeah, and if you're also interested in watching this and want to be a part of our team, you know, we do have um, opportunities uh, in the future for to join our team and and learn directly from us uh, and grow with us together. So awesome. Well, thanks, everybody, for all of your questions today and all of the positive feedback. We love all of you. We appreciate all of you and everybody have a great day. And, oh, and thanks again to Ryan for being awesome. So everybody. have a Thanks, great everybody. Day.